Good afternoon. I'm Karen, and this is my colleague Maggie. Um, we are going to present to you some Flemish examples of good practice in higher education. Um, maybe it's interesting that we first start by explaining where we work and what we do. Um, we work for the Flemish Support Centre for Inclusive Higher Education. What we do is supporting all Flemish higher education institutions to become more inclusive for students with a disability. So we want them to create equal opportunities and full participation for students with a disability. Um, we only work for the Flemish part, so that means the north on the map you can see where all the higher education, higher education institutions are. What we do, um, are, we do a lot of work around universal design for learning, um, different things, organizing conferences, doing coachings for uh, lecturers. Um, but, but besides that, we also do different things, like we are a help desk for higher education institutions. They can phone us with all kinds of questions. Um, other teams we work on is employment, mobility, we try to organize networking between the different institutions. Um, we also work around awareness raising, um, all different things. Uh, as a support center, we take part in different European projects. Um, we are a partner in the LINK network. Um, we are also a partner in a new Erasmus Plus project about universal design for learning. And we are also part uh, of the expert group of, on access and inclusion of EIEA. So the content of this presentation will be on UDL and the UDL coaching we organize in, in Belgium, and also the examples of good practice. But first, my colleague will explain something about UDL and how we see it. So um, and we're not going to be too ter theoretical about UDL because uh, tomorrow we have the keynote of Dr. Uh, David Rose who will uh, go into that. Uh, but we see um, that uh, UDL and we see that diversity is the norm. That's the basic uh, line, I think, um, from universal design, from universal design for learning also. Um, so the way we learn is as unique as our fingerprints and we have to take the diversity into account when we um, yeah, adapt, when, when we not, not adapt, but when we design our learning environment, our lessons, our uh, examinations, and so on. So uh, we use the framework of UDL with the three main principles. So uh, you have the multiple means of representation, uh, multiple means of action and expression, and the multiple means of engagement. So um, what we did uh, is for each, um, actually we organized a UDL a cartoon contest in the in Flemish uh, part of, of Belgium where we asked everyone could hand in a cartoon on uh, accessible education, on universal design for learning, on the three principles, but we organized, we, 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 yeah, we divided the cartoons into the three principles. So uh, for the first principle, we have here a cartoon, um, a teacher coming home saying, those classes with sign language are back-breaking. Uh, so it's not easy to be accessible uh, all the time. Uh, the first, uh, the second principle uh, cartoon about it is um, there was a lesson on flying, so the teacher said today it's flying, uh, but we have a penguin shooter for the penguin who cannot uh, fly. And the third principle, uh, there was a teacher who was wanted, who really wanted to be um, that students were involved, and he said, since cat movies are very popular on the internet, uh, I got the idea to arouse the students' um, interest during class, and he certainly got their attention, and it became a YouTube hit, uh, the lesson. So it's really nice to see how, how you can engage with UDL in different ways also. <clears throat> Uh, one of the important things we do is organizing UDL coaching for um, lecturers in higher education. Um, most of the UDL coachings consist of four coaching moments, but it can differ according to what higher education institutions want. But a standard coaching is um, four moments. The four moments are on different days, so it can take a whole academic year to do all the, all the sessions. Um, the first moment is about the theory uh, and the concept of universal design for learning. So we try to explain them what it is, why it is important. And we also already start with um, 
something practical. We start from their own experience, some things they do, what they think is um, accessible for the diversity of students um, in their classroom, so they can share good examples with each other. And a second thing we do in the first session is um, asking them for problems or barriers they experience. It can be, for example, uh, every year I try to explain them something about a certain topic and they never understand. It's always a problem to explain them something like that. And then we think with the group um, about solutions or um, ways to, to handle that barrier. And we do it in a certain way that's called brain writing. I, the, there was a picture on the slide, but it's gone, so I don't know where. But it's a, a paper, and on top they, they can write their, their problem, and then the paper is divided in different squares, and in every square uh, the next person in the row can write or invent solutions for the problem uh, the one person experienced. So we give the paper uh, to the next person, then to the next person. So four persons give advice on the, on the problem. And when the person who has the problem goes home, he has all kinds of solutions that he can try, he or she can try uh, at home in the, or in the classroom. And we think it, it's really uh, powerful because um, there's a lot of creativity in the group. Uh, teachers are really engaged. Uh, they, they have lots of experience, they have ideas, and they can help each other. So that's the first um, moment. The second moment, um, we zoom into the course material of the teachers, um, and we every teacher can bring can bring their course material to the, to the session, and we look at barriers in the material, and we search for solutions according to the UDL principles. The third moment is about UDL and ICT, and then we are looking at um, which ICT tools can help um, teachers to be more uh, engaging, to be more accessible for students in general. We also let them practice so they are behind computers and we really help them to work with, with the tools. It can be timelines or mind maps or whatever. They can, they can also choose which tool they want to practice in, in that session. And the last session is about universal design for learning and evaluation. And then we look at how they can be more accessible uh, in assessment. Um, out of these uh, coaching sessions, there are a lot of good examples come because there's a lot of sharing of experiences, of creativity, and some of the examples we're going to present now. Um, the first example is from uh, Pat van Ecke. He teaches applied psychology at West University College. Um, he works with, with quotes in his class, um, and he used to give a quote to the students and then they could raise a green or a red card, but that was a little bit old-fashioned, and then he discovered Tricider, or Tricider, which is a, a tool to vote for uh, quotes. So he puts the quote online in the tool, and then students can vote for certain answers, but the good thing about it is also that they can add extra uh, answers or they can like answers from other persons. And the good thing about it is that um, the students really feel engaged and he also likes it a lot because they can add extra information to the, it's not just green or red, it's just more than that you can give extra IDs. So it's very engaging for the students and he also advises this to it, it to his colleagues. Another example is from the same university college, uh, a lecturer on, in biomedical laboratory technology. Uh, she uses a lot of um, images, microscopical images in her PowerPoint presentations. And then she, she asks questions about those images to her students. And she felt that it, were, it was always the same students who answered and who were being engaged. So she tried to find a solution for that. And she used the tool uh, Socrative. I don't know if it's... Uh, something familiar for, for some. Uh, it also, it's a tool where you can, yeah, you can um, ask in the tool, in the online tool, open questions or multiple choice questions. And she, so she showed the picture and then students um, go to Socrative and answer those questions. So it's anonymous for the students. And Annaline, the professor, um, got immediate anonymous, 
the feedback from students, and more students were engaged in this way. Of course, students could then also talk about it, talk about it but uh, in the beginning she used the tool uh, Socrative. The same uh, lecture also uh, implemented uh, more um, ways of assessment. Uh, she said that um, during coaching, uh, she felt that actually she, she was doing the assessment uh, in one way, uh, always with uh, students' reports uh, from, the, from the practical things. But she said, um, I often see in the reports, I can see the students are doing a lot more. I know them and they know more than I see in the written reports. So she added more things also, oral things also, uh, more uh, uh, they have to, uh, some students keep a log or a blog and she, 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 she looked at, the, at that also. So uh, next to that, they also had, of course, a written exam, but she added to that that uh, students had the opportunity to uh, have also an, an oral comments on the written exam. So if they felt, if students felt they had to do it, they, they could uh, add oral, um, yeah, oral an oral uh, meeting with, with the professor also. I just wanted to say that all the tools that we use in the coaching sessions and also the examples here, they're free tools on the internet, so everybody can log in or use them for, for free. Um, we think that's important because sometimes it can be very expensive and then teachers don't use it because of the, the price. So we're always looking for um, free tools to use. Um, the next good example uh, from Flemish higher education institutions is from Professor Natasha de Roost. She teaches clinical experimental psychology at the University of Brussels. Um, she teaches day classes to, to the young students, but also um, in the evening she teaches the same classes to the students who are working uh, in daytime. Um, and she thinks it's very important that she makes digital recordings of her classes. So it's good for the students who are coming in the evening because they see the, sta the same amount of content but on a shorter time. So if they need more information or they need more time, they can watch the online recordings. Um, and it's also good for other students uh, who follow the day classes because sometimes you didn't get everything in class but then you can uh, go to the, to the recordings online. So. It looks like, like you can see on the picture, on the right hand side, you can see the, the PowerPoint, the slide she uses, and on the left hand side, you see in the corner on top, uh, yeah, the recording of the class. So you, you can see, really see the professor on it. And on the left hand side, more uh, underneath the, the video is uh, the content and also the timing. So students can choose which part they want to see. They don't have to see the whole class if it's not necessary. And she puts everything on the online learning platform of the, of the group. Another example um, is uh, from um, Ghent University, uh, Professor uh, Hide Tere. Uh, he gives courses on data, data analysis. Um, and um, before the coaching um, of, of UDL, he, uses, he used a manual with a lot of text, just a manual with only text, uh, no images. Um, and in his PowerPoint presentations he used, he um, really, um, sticked onto the manual and he had a lot of text also in, a, in his PowerPoint presentation. It was actually uh, a summary but in, in the text and he felt that students were, were not engaged but they, because they felt yeah it's just a summary. Uh, some, he, hadn't, he, he didn't have a lot of students also in his classes so he was thinking about it and he adopted his PowerPoint presentation using a much more um, yeah, um, graphics, uh, images, uh, videos. Uh, here you see an example of, of his presentations now. Um, for example, for the historical evolution uh, of the data analysis, he, he uses more uh, pictures. And he felt that um, students were more engaged. He also, as a teacher, felt more uh, confident. He, he got rid of the manual in his head and he became more a teacher. Um, telling more the story about, uh, telling more the story, um, he felt more comfortable and uh, he also saw in the assessment and the evaluation that the students uh, scored better. So um, he felt very, uh, yeah, 
he was very uh, pleased with that. Um, that he also is a, a, a professor who um, he was a bit afraid if I use too much uh, images, um, it would be more silly, or he, students will uh, yeah, they will um, not like it or find it stupid. But he he discovered it was not the case, so he really liked that. Another example is from Ghent University, from uh, practical assistant Katrien de Munk. She um, works with students that go on internships abroad. So the students study pedagogy, but for their internship they go to countries sometimes far away in Africa, South America, and it's sometimes difficult to stay in contact with them, to know what they are doing. Um, they're also on their own over there. They don't have their fellow students, because the other students they come who stay in Belgium, they come together regularly to talk about how it goes, what they are doing, um, just to exchange. But the students that go abroad, they are just there on their own and you don't know what's happening to them or what they are doing. So she decided to use a blog. Um, and on that blog, every, every student has a profile and they post some kind of diary on that, on that profile. So they tell what they are doing. Um, so, and, but also when they have problems or when they are in, insecure about some things, they can post it online. And then the other students who are also abroad, they can, they can exchange or they can give advice or tips uh, to the students who have questions. So that's good for the, for the students who are abroad. They, they have a group to be in contact with, uh, students who have similar experiences. But also good for, the, for Katrien herself, who is from the university and who is at home. She, she really, yeah, now she knows what they are doing, how they are going, otherwise it might be difficult to, to be in contact with them and, or to help them from a distance. So the blog really helps both parties. Another example is from um, the teacher training department in secondary education uh, in a university college, college uh, PXL. Um, this is an example of a cooperation through, through Wiki. It's, I don't know what happened with the slide. <laughs> um, so students, uh, at the end of the third year, they have to organize an interdisciplinary um, journey together. And it's not, um, it really is a journey, not only online, but they prepare it uh, together online. So interdisciplinary, for example, a student who has a subject of history, uh, then, uh, or in groups, they prepare, for example, a historian walk through, uh, through the city. Um, this um, screenshot is from a wiki um, uh, of an interdisciplinary um, journey they, they, uh, they had in 2011 uh, to Morocco. So the students also choose for themselves the, where they will go. So it's really engaging, I think, for the students. Uh, and, uh, but the lecture um, really helps in, uh, the lecture sets up the wiki, makes the structure, also sets, uh, sets up goals, uh, tasks, um, gives feedback at certain moments, uh, has an initial lesson in explaining what is, um, yeah, what's, what's the task and how they will uh, manage it together. Um, the, those trips are, it's already for certain years, but it's, it was the first time that year that they did it on a wiki, uh, because um, before they did it in a Word document, but by um, working together in, in a wiki, it's like they building up together a website, you see the progress, you see also uh, what's happening uh, from each other, you can give feedback. So that was a nice thing also. Uh, using that ICT tool. But of course, without the ICT tool, it was also a very nice example of how you can engage students. Another example is from the same university college. Um, they use um, an electronic portfolio evaluation system. Um, it is very useful to register and evaluate the student's learning process and progress in a continuous and transparent way. Um, it's online and the student can really see uh, for each part of the program which evaluation criteria are used and what are the underlying competences. Um, and they also can see which scale is used to evaluate them. Is it just uh, good or not good or is it with points? Um, it's all online and they can really follow up their own progress. 
Uh, this is an example of, um, actually there's a, a mistake on the slide, it's not from business management, but it is uh, from another teaching, training department uh, at the University College Odyssey. Uh, it's about uh, how you can give uh, feedback during an internship. Um, on, on the upper left side there's an image of, um, um, you see um, on the left, on the left of the image you see which competences um, are expected, so uh, the students have a list of the competences they have to reach during the internship, and then next to that you have a scale from one to five. So the teacher can say now you are, uh, you have a two, but um, by the end you have you can reach a four or a five. So you have that tool to to, uh, to negotiate also or to see the progress to give feedback. Um, and on the right side you see a, a growth axe. Um, on professional attitudes, so uh, it's not so very um, visible, it's also in, in Dutch, but um, the professional attitudes are like, for example, responsibility, uh, flexibility, and that tool is used by, uh, so the student fills in the tool, but um, so, so fills in the growth acts, but also the mentor at the school where the internship is going, and also the teacher from the higher education institution. So you have the three perspectives on the growth acts, and you can also see, uh, for example, in the, in, the, in the middle of the internship, it was done, and by the end, and you can see how it develops. And the student says about his way of evaluating, uh, after, my after my first internship, for example, I had a low figure on organization talent, uh, and it was actually due to my writing on the, on the board, which was not so clear, uh, and I worked hard, hard on it, and now my grades are better. So a student finds it a nice tool to, uh, to see how he can, uh, yeah, doing things better or progress. Uh, there's another example from the same university college, PXL. Um, when they uh, do evaluation of students, they always do it in several ways. So every student has to take a written exam, a permanent evaluation through an assignment or several assignments, and an oral exam. Um, and in that way, every student has the has the chance to perform well on at least one of the one of the evaluation forms. And a student can really show what he knows because he's not limited to, for example, writing. And if you're not good in writing, you're unlucky. So when you do several kinds uh, of evaluation, every student has a chance to perform well. And then the last example is from um, the, the Department of the Pedagogy of the Young Child at University College KDG. Um, the head of the department, um, they decided to um, that every student can do, um, that exams can be, be done in different ways. So this is an abstract of an article, it was in a newspaper, it says uh, exams for each, um, each one has its own way uh, to do exams. Um, but actually the head of the department says we, not, we choose, students can choose between, for example, an oral exam or a written exam, or they can choose if it is a written exam, for example, between, um, uh, a written exam uh, with open questions or uh, a multiple choice uh, exam, for example. Uh, and she said that um, because of those, um, because of that policy, less students ask for reasonable adjustments uh, because they can choose, for example, for an oral exam instead of a written exam. Um, so that was a nice thing uh, she could see in the policy. So we are through the examples we have for this uh, um, presentation. If you have more questions, these are our uh, contact details, um, and you can follow us also on Facebook and Twitter. It's always nice to, to see things going on there. Thank you. Thank you, Karen and Mechi. This was the Flemish perspective, not the Dutch. <laughs> um, any questions? It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Jared Gallagher is my name from Dublin Institute of Technology. I'm just curious, how many academics have engaged with, uh, with your UDL workshops at this stage? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah, but, um, 
We have counted them, but I forgot yes. the numbers. I also forgot the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> They're in our year reports. But um, I think we, we have, um, it's hard to say, more than 100. OK. Yes. But we also have um, EDL days and it, intensive training days, and that was, yeah. But it, it will be more than 100. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my name is Irma van Sloten from the Netherlands, a Dutch question. Mm -hmm. um, you shared with us your form formula of training and coaching uh, these teachers. Uh, what would a logical next step be? It sounded uh, quite basic, having a fundament to start working with UDL. Uh, what would be the more, yeah, the next step? Can you share your thoughts on that? I don't. Uh, the next step of of um, coaching or just for us as a support center, what would be our next step? So yeah, it's a, it's a good question actually because mm -hmm. we are uh, a small organization. We can't uh, go everywhere uh, talking in every institution, doing a lot of sessions. But we also I always say um, it's always nice when, uh, for example, within um, university or university colleges, uh, the policy is also involved in it. And um, for sometimes we use. Um, um, how you call um, a train the trainer? Uh, we use um, sometimes um, someone from the university or university college follows also the coachings uh, or starts with it and then they follow it up. So that's the way we want. We we don't want to uh, do it uh, alone. We just want. Um, the institutions to to go further on it, so we have to build, we have to work on that also, and perhaps do more train the trainers or look how the policy can take UDL into their um, yeah, into their uh, teacher profession trainings and so. Yeah. We also have an, an online e-learning e yeah. module, um, so there are different ways that we in, dif in different ways we try to reach the the public we want to reach. So. It are in the first place uh, teachers, but I also think, like Maggie says, that um, the policy level is very important, especially because we cannot do all the work by ourselves. Um, so it would be good that they can pass it on uh, to their teachers. Yeah, one more question over there. Oh, yeah, how are you? Uh, well done. Uh, that's uh, Vivian Rath, uh, Trinity College, Dublin. I just said, the, yeah, there you Yeah, sorry. The really handsome fella down at the back of the room. <laughs> Uh, the, so I'm just interested to, to note uh, how uh, how are the the universities uh, incentivizing or are they incentivizing uh, their staff to engage uh, with programs like that? And then that's number one. And part two of the question uh, is in, when you do the training with them, uh, do you do you follow up later on to uh, to ensure that they uh, that that are continuing to use it, mm -hmm. and uh, that uh, has 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 that been positive, uh, and and are they are, are they using it effectively? I'm, I'm just interested to yeah. to know mm -hmm. because there's many people do a course, have great intentions like starting a diet, uh, and then that a year later, uh, look that's too much bother. I haven't lost any weight, and um, so just maybe just part one and part two. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Regarding the incentives, um, we all we have contact persons in every higher education institution. Uh, so we we contact them and they uh, provide the information about the, the coaching sessions to their uh, to their academic staff, and they can register to follow um, our training days, or they can organize it in their higher education institution for, for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so that's. We, we, we make publicity about um, the training days and the coaching sessions and they can, it has to come from them, they, they have to, to register, but until now we always have find people who want to follow coaching sessions, so mm -hmm. we really got questions from them, can you organize another day, can you come to our university or university college? Also from one university, uh, the policy organized it. So sometimes when, and, and teachers also could have a budget for implementing some ICT tools. They, they didn't use much of the budget, but, but it was nice that the 
they could have and that the policy was able to, to work on that. And um, so the, there were 50 uh, applies for the coaching and they only could have, there only were um, 12 places available. So it was um, a good um, coaching session um, with that. But for following up, we think we, sh we, we always try to uh, give it back to the institution. We as a support center, we try to uh, network again, follow it up, but we don't uh, follow up individual uh, staff. We think it's 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 also a part of the institution to follow up, then do the policy to follow up. Thank you very much. I think we have to quit now because we have to move further. Uh, I saw there were some more questions, but we have to take it afterwards during like, the next two days. Uh, thank you, Marianne, Karen. Thank you.